Case at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Sparks flying today between the prosecution and the defense during a hearing for the upcoming trial of indicted ex-constable Michelle Barrientes Vela. At issue, whether comments made by the district attorney's former political consultant should cause the DA to be removed from the high-profile case. Dylan Collier on how it all played out and what's at stake. Michelle Barrientes Vela was just an observer as the man whose office is prosecuting her public corruption case took center stage. District Attorney Joe Gonzalez, despite objections from his staff, forced to answer questions about his professional relationship with his one-time political consultant, Robert Vargas. Gonzalez claiming it's unreasonable to believe that someone who hasn't worked for him in well over three years still has influence over him. Vargas, who helped Gonzalez beat Nico LaHood in the March 2018 Democratic primary before departing the campaign, was accused in late June of making comments prior to hosting a radio show about the Barrientes Vela case that Judge Velia Mesa viewed as a threat. Mike Villarreal, a guest on that day's show, testified to what he heard Vargas say to another guest. He made a comment that if she doesn't do the right thing, meaning the judge, um, then he will run someone against her. As in run someone against Mesa in her next primary election. Today's hearing, which took place in front of a visiting judge, was likely a precursor to a formal motion being filed to have the DA tossed from the case and was not without several tense moments between LaHood and Vargas, as the consultant repeatedly said he couldn't remember making any comments about Mesa. I don't recall making that comment. You said, I can't believe she dismissed the Objection, case. Objection, Your Honor. He stated he does not recall another pleading. His story. Well, he's a hostile witness, Judge. He just conveniently didn't remember, so the facts will show what they show. I think it's the uh, defense counsel that is trying to muddy the waters to make it look like something that it's not. A judge, likely Mesa, will issue a ruling on whether the DA will stay on once a formal motion is filed. It's almost easy to forget at this point that this hearing is tied to an actual criminal case. Barrientes Vela had been scheduled to go to trial beginning in late September. That will in all likelihood be delayed again after this week's suspension of in-person jury services. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Both sides resting today in the punishment phase of the trial of Otis McCain, convicted of capital murder in the case of San Antonio Police Detective Benjamin Marconi. That means jurors are expected to get the case tomorrow with the death penalty as an option as the sentence. Here's Erica Hernandez with a recap of the testimony. For six days, the punishment phase has presented more than 15 witnesses. Both sides presented experts. That's one of the dynamic variables when you look ahead that I factored into my assessment of what's his risk for dangerousness when he's in settings with the system, with law, other law enforcement personnel. Remorselessness or not caring that you'd harm someone, that also had no predictive value. It didn't say somebody would or wouldn't harm someone again. And also, we heard from family members. I have to be stronger because he was such a strong person and I want that to stay alive, and I want to be a good example for him. <laughs> this capital murder trial lasting for four weeks has brought a lot of emotions and surprising moments, but now it will soon all be up to the jury to decide on punishment. Now the options this jury has for sentencing is either life without parole or the death penalty. Court resumes tomorrow at 9 a.m. with closing arguments. Erica Hernandez, Case at 12 News. Castle Hills police arresting a man they say was preying upon some especially vulnerable victims, teenage runaways. Officers say they found the teens inside an apartment in Castle Hills after getting a call for help. As Katrina Weber reports, the suspect, well known to law enforcement. What are you with some choice words for news crews, 38-year-old Jason Klauser made his way to a patrol car overnight. His arrest marked the end of an hours-long investigation and what Castle Hills police say was a stretch of sexual abuse aimed at two teenage runaways. They say a call from a parent yesterday afternoon led them to an apartment in the 1400 block of Jackson Keller where they found the victims, a brother and sister, both 16 years old. Apparently the parent had found out that her runaway children uh, were at that 
location, so we went to do a welfare check. Officers quickly realized that all was not well. They say they found the teens in a bedroom. What we determined once we were able to recover that the children were, discovered that the, were, the children were inside was that um, possibly some sexual activity had been going on. Police say Clouser doesn't exactly live at this apartment complex, that he was simply staying here. It's unclear how the teens ended up with him here, but police say when they found them, they were in a bad state. One victim was possibly intoxicated from a controlled substance, and the other one uh, was just so traumatized that um, she, she really didn't want to talk much. Police were careful not to disclose a lot of details, saying they plan to talk to the victims again. Like those kids did? You. Outside of the cussing, Klauser wasn't saying much either, but his criminal record says a lot. An assortment of arrests and convictions dating back at least 10 years. These latest charges are sexual assault of a child. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, the city of San Antonio says it continues to work closely with nonprofits to welcome and assist migrants coming through the city as they head to their final destination. 100 to 500 migrants are arriving daily at the airport. The food bank is looking for volunteers who speak different languages to help the migrants. Tiffany Huertas has more on that and the story of an Ecuadorian woman who made a dangerous trek to the United States. Alexandra says traveling through Mexico was dangerous. There were kidnappings, robberies and scams. The single mother traveled from Ecuador to Mexico in plane and then crossed into the U.S. looking for a better life. Alexandra says she is sad that she left her family behind, but is happy because she is in the country of opportunities. She is one of hundreds of migrants arriving daily at the airport. A city spokesperson tells us when migrants arrive, they are provided with basic needs and travel assistance with the help of city employees and volunteers. One of the organizations the city is working with is the San Antonio Food Bank. The food bank's been providing meals and kind of hygiene kits and um, you know, different snack items, things that can be helpful in their journey. President of the food bank, Eric Cooper, says they are looking for volunteers who can assist migrants and speak different languages. We are responding to diverse populations that are coming through. But this isn't the first time the food bank has helped migrants arriving to San Antonio. Several years ago, there was a surge of migrants um, downtown across from the bus station. Uh, the Migrant Resource Center was established and the food bank was there. There are three shifts daily volunteers can sign up for on the food bank's website. Cooper says volunteers must wear masks and they are encouraged to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Lots of people have reached out to me to say, it's heartbreaking to see what's happening with the migrants and we want to do something to help. My plan is... As for Alexandra, she wants to build a better life for her family. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Tonight we are hearing from a woman who says she has lived to regret her decision not to get vaccinated. She wants you to know that so you don't find yourself doing the same thing. 35-year-old Monique Chavez is just one in a growing number of unvaccinated COVID-19 patients at University Hospital. The single mother of two teenagers had a fever and shortness of breath for about a week before calling 911 last Sunday. She says this was her first thought when she realized she might die. My kids, my kids, my 13 and my 15-year-old, and I would hate for them not to be able to not see their mother again for something that could have been prevented by just getting shot. Chavez now says she and her children will all be vaccinated as soon as they can after she's released from the hospital. That could be as soon as Sunday, a week after being admitted. So she is among the more fortunate ones. Still, she says this has been a life changing experience that started with her believing rumors and what she was reading on social media. True to his word, Governor Greg Abbott has called another special legislative session to try to pass a Republican backed voting bill. Today's announcement coming after Democrats left the state in protest to again keep Republicans from changing the state's election laws. More than 50 Democrats left the state for Washington, D.C. on July 12th to wait out the current special session, but there is no clear path for them to permanently block that bill. 
The new special session begins at noon Saturday with an expanded agenda. Among the 17 items, the voting bill and other carryovers like the transgender youth sports ban. But there are a half dozen new items, including the spending of federal COVID relief funds and changing the legislative rules regarding quorums. To see the full agenda, just log on to KSAT.com. Look outside with live cam this evening. Remember yesterday when I was impressed it was 89 <laughs> degrees at 6 o'clock? I've been one-upped. I was going to say, we keep just improving it for you, <laughs> don't we? Uh, yes, only 84 degrees, mid-80s now for a good portion of our area. We had a high temperature now officially of 88 degrees, 9 degrees below average for this time of year. At the airport, we had about a quarter of an inch of rain in the bucket. You look elsewhere, highest accumulation, southern half of Bear County and southwest of San Antonio, especially closer to the Rio Grande. No rain gauges out there, but rainfall estimates are over four inches in parts of Zavala County, southern Maverick and uh, Dimmick County. Uh, you look at actual reading, Somerset, south side of Bear County, over three inches. You get to Elmendorf, nearly two inches. Stinson at just over two inches, but then North of Highway 90, about a quarter of an inch. We're going to get a little bit of a break from the rainy pattern. We'll talk about that rain chances for tonight and tomorrow, along with how hot it's going to get coming right up. Several school districts still need bus drivers with just weeks or even days to go before classes start once again. Northside is going completely in person this year, so more students will need transportation to school. They need about 60 bus drivers plus bus assistants, but officials tell me they're confident they'll be ready for school once it opens for students on August 23rd. Northside ISD's McClung Transportation Center is a busy place these days. Staff are working on buses from under the hood to each and every seat. The drivers are prepping too. So we're ready, we're getting ready. Our bus drivers are currently um, getting their CDL physicals and going through training. Uh, we'll do some refresher courses next week. At the same time, the district needs more drivers to fill those trainings. They're short about 60 drivers with weeks to go. Transportation Director Tecilia Garza says it's a common problem for school districts and the pandemic initially made things worse. Once the shot was uh, put into place, we did see people coming back. Um, they felt safer with the shot, but we are still, uh, we still have a high shortage of, of drivers. Northside is touting its 32 hour guarantee, which makes drivers full time and eligible for benefits and free CDL training as a way to get drivers back on the buses. The bus is the very first classroom that the child enters every day. The bus driver most times is the first and the last Northside employee that the kids see. And so we have an ability to make an impact on the lives of the kids. And Northside is also finalizing this year's routes and those will be available on the district's website beginning on the 26th. And Northside ISD is holding a job fair for those positions this Monday from 9 to noon at the Activity Center on Calabria Road. Let's take a look at some uh, traffic uh, this evening. Things a lot quieter than they have been, especially uh, the fact that we don't have any rain uh, this evening. This is I-10 at the Y. We had some big issues there yesterday. Definitely not seeing that today. So you look across uh, the area. There was a stalled vehicle here at 37 and 35 where that all comes together. That has cleared out. Let's go up here to the northwest side. Let's start on Loop 410. Things looking a lot better there than they did earlier this afternoon. Seven to eight minutes between I-10 and State Highway 151. 1604, we're going to have some work out here as we have throughout uh, the week overnight, but things looking, uh, it could be a lot worse, let's put it that way. Uh, 15 minutes between Bandera and 281, and then 21 minutes between uh, 281 and Bandera Road, guys. All righty, thank you, Samuel. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 flying high above the city. If that had been this morning, probably wouldn't have been flying. Lots of uh, <laughs> dark clouds, thunder, lightning. What a way to start another rainy day, Adam. Hey, you know, good, healthy maintenance rain out there today, and that was nice to see. And it looks like we're going to get into a fairly quiet pattern here in right. the days ahead. That's good. <laughs> We say that now, right? Right, yeah, you <laughs> said that before. How long is it going to last? <laughs> how long is it going to last? So into next week is how long it's going to last, at least for now. So high temperatures today, check this out. This is for Myra right here, Ooh, right? Okay, I'm hates, hates triple digits, right? <laughs> don't, don't like it too hot. Mm -mm. It's August. Hondo at a high of 86. Uvalde, 83. Del Rio, oh. 88 degrees. Catula, 
only up to 90. So often we're seeing triple digits on that map. Not the case today with the rain and of course the lingering clouds as a result of the rain. Yeah, no complaints. That's supposed to be a rain gauge picture there. <laughs> anyway, let's skip that and move right on to the drought monitor. This is back in late April. Okay, this is when we were really in the peak of our drought around here. Okay, 65% of the state was in drought. Of that, a lot of it was here in South Texas and West Texas. But let's fast forward to today. Boom, it's wiped away. Only 1% of the Lone Star State is in drought. And that's this little area near Big Bend National Park. We're talking due south of Marathon, Big Bend National Park area considered in a moderate drought and abnormally dry conditions indicated by this yellow color around it. So a pretty rural part of Texas, beautiful part of Texas, probably my favorite part of Texas, out west Texas, beautiful out there. And that's where we still have some lingering drought. Of course, you look at the big picture and we can relate to the folks out west, west of the Front Range, the Rockies, still deep in drought. Here's our overall weather pattern. No big dominating feature, but subtle ones and that were enough to kickstart widespread rain earlier today. First of all, this frontal boundary to the south of us, that's still lingering. It's been there pretty much all week and it's still stalled out. It's just a little convergence line where the wind comes together and then when it comes together, it can't go down because it hits the ground. It goes up and helps to generate lift and get some showers going. And then today we also had a little trough to the north of us as well as a weak little upper disturbance that meandered its way in from Mexico. And that is what's mostly to credit for the rain that we had earlier today and the rain showers, especially this morning. You look at the radar now, most of the action is between Laredo and Corpus Christi, right along that weak frontal boundary, that convergence line. But a few showers have been developing here in southeastern Atascosa County, near Campbellton, right along I-37. You go past the country store there and quick little downpour. And that's pretty much all we have. Carnes County as well, getting a few little pop-ups. Can't rule out a stray shower or two tonight. Tomorrow we'll have that 30% chance. So what does happen to develop should be pretty isolated and basically few and far between, not as much out there. And I know we've got that 0% for the weekend and next week. With that, yeah, a few showers could pop up closer to the Gulf Coast line. More of a typical summertime pattern around here. We're not talking the big blue H sitting overhead, but just some of those pop up afternoon showers closer to the Gulf Coast. 80s right now, 80s in August, 88 in Casterville, 81 Bulverde Canyon Lake and Bernie Converse, 83 degrees measured at Randolph. Catula only at 90 and Del Rio actually now up to 89. So that's their new high temperature for the day. Can't rule out that highly isolated shower this evening and tonight. Otherwise, partly cloudy, calm wind, temps falling through the 70s, 74 to start the day tomorrow, 92 for the high temperature. Isolated shower or two popping up here and there and really not a whole lot of a breeze out of the southeast uh, pretty light into the weekend. Nothing but sunshine, still only mid 90s. This extra uh, soil moisture will, will actually prevent temperatures from really getting out of control despite a lot of sunshine and will remain near to even slightly below average into next week. All right. Never thought I'd be thankful for soil moisture. I don't even but know where I we am. amen to that, right? <laughs> I don't even know where we are anymore. <laughs> are we still in San Antonio? We'll take it. <laughs> right. well, sports is, uh, is next and Larry Ramirez is here and Larry, the we're getting a look at the Spurs first round draft pick. You know, it's pretty cool. We could go tonight. Joshua Primo was selected by the Spurs and then last night he got to play in his first summer league game. He missed the night before because of calf tightness. And I'll tell you what, young man looked pretty good and he's already critiquing himself. Plus, the Marvin Leal and the Aggies are reporting for fall camp. Coming up. Um, not really. I think um, I could have done a lot better keeping down the turnovers, taking care of the ball. Spurs work Joshua Primo feels he could have played better in his NBA debut in Big Board Sports. Spurs 2021 first round draft pick Joshua Primo made his NBA Summer League Salt Lake City debut last night against Utah Jazz Blue Squad. Primo started, he scored 11 points in 20 minutes. He had a team high six turnovers though in the Spurs 78-54 loss. Still, putting on that NBA jersey felt great. Absolutely, I mean, it's a different feeling. Um, 
coming into what's kind of like your first NBA game. But then again, it is just basketball. So you got to go into it with the same mentality that you would uh, if it was in college, high school, middle school. So. Spurs will close out Salt Lake City play tomorrow night at 6 against Memphis. And how about this? Former UTSA basketball star Keaton Wallace made his NBA Salt Lake City debut with Memphis last night. And he scored 17 points in 30 minutes. He shot 7 for 14 overall, 3 of 6 from 3-point range to go with 3 rebounds, 3 assists, and 3 steals. I definitely do need to make some improvements on defense. Um, uh, Megan, Megan uh, you know, helping. Uh, off the ball, things like that. I can tighten up on my own ball defense. Uh, I got beat a couple of times today. Um, just team defense, playing the backside, rotating, things like that. I can definitely uh, sharpen up on my defense. Wallace said his main focus is to try and get better every game. It is report day for UTSA football ahead of their first fall camp practice tomorrow. And for some, today is their first chance to see the new $40 million race facility. UTSA was picked to finish second this season in Conference USA West, and many of their players have received multiple preseason honors. Coach Trailer preaches don't eat the cheese, which he says he uses sarcastically yet serious at the same time. It's just a reminder. That, and I'm not trying to be negative towards the people that pick that stuff. I'm very grateful without media and without that no one cares about us. So y'all have a huge, <laughs> a huge part in us. So it's fun like, to buy those magazines and talk about that stuff. But the very people that picked us last last year are now picking a second. We already showed they don't really know what they're doing when they're picking. So we shouldn't put too much credit into all that stuff. Right. So that's one angle. Coach said the other angles, if you believe all that stuff, are you still going to work as hard as last year? Former UTSA star Marcus Davenport has his own wall inside the race facility to honor the first roadrunner to be selected in the first round of the NFL draft when the Saints picked him 14th overall in the 2018 NFL draft. And there's another wall called Roadrunners in the NFL with nameplates of those roadrunners past or present in the NFL. Texas A&M football is reporting for fall camp in College Station. The Aggies expect to contend for the SEC championship and national championship this season. Heading into camp, their defense is their strength, and anchoring that unit is Judson alum DeMarvin Leal. We recently caught up with him at Rutledge Stadium, where Leal said he's ready to lead the charge. My expectation is just to be able to be a leader of the defense line and of the defense and the team, of course, and just, you know, just make sure that we're at our standard and that we're all committed to our goal and just get after it this season. Leal and the Aggies kick off their season Saturday, September 4th, 7 p.m. at Kyle Field with Kent State right around the corner. I know that's coming up pretty soon. Can't, can't wait for football, <laughs> college and pro. Exactly. All right there, thank you very much. Our KSAT Q&A with Dr. Ruth Bergeron is up next. Our local hospitals are headed toward a crisis point as cases continue to surge with this latest Delta variant of COVID-19. In today's KSAC Q&A, we are joined as always on Thursdays by Dr. Ruth Bergren, infectious disease specialist with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Doctor, thanks for being here as always. Let's start with what our hospitals are facing because this has implications for people not only suffering with COVID, but any other reasons to head to a hospital. So what is the situation in our emergency rooms right now? I'm sorry to bring a tough message to San Antonio this evening, but I was just on the phone with the director of our emergency medicine department, Dr. Riviello, and he told me the truth which is that there are just record-breaking numbers of people in the emergency room and also in the hospital. We have a lot of people in the emergency room, both with COVID and without COVID. It seems to be just a really high volume time for people getting sick in general. And our message is don't come in unless it's a true emergency and also to use some of the urgent care centers that we have all over the city uh, to take care of your other needs. But, you know, we were seeing a doubling of hospitalizations due to COVID about every two week, 10 days to two weeks since the middle of July. And we're at a pretty high level right now. I, I think we have a graphic that can demonstrate this right now. I want people to see just how steep that curve is and imagine uh, what will happen if we do get another doubling in just 10 days. 
Um, we, we see here that the risk level um, that is on the city of San Antonio's website is now severe. It's no longer moderate, um, and it is reflecting not just the increased uh, percentage of positivity in the community, but also the level of stress for the hospital. So here's the uh, inpatient trends for all of the San Antonio healthcare systems together. And actually that number of 938 was updated today to 967. So just between uh, yesterday and today, it continues to rise. And just look how steep the slope of that curve is. It's rising even, I would say, more steeply than it was uh, last November. So we're unfortunately um, heading into a situation where the hospital systems are already strained. And if we continue to have these cases come in, they're going to be strained to the point where we're not going to take good care of people with strokes, heart attacks, and car accidents. And I wish I didn't have to say those things, but I need people to understand this is where we are. Your healthcare system is extremely strained right now. And keeping people out of the hospital, not necessarily keeping them in, from getting infected, but keeping people out of the hospital, the vaccine is what's key for that. Is it correct that we're still looking at a overwhelming majority of people who are unvaccinated ending up in the hospital. That's so that's so true. And another way of looking at it is if you look at all of our new cases in the last four weeks, only 5% of these new cases, 5% are in vaccinated people. The rest are in the unvaccinated. And if you look inside the hospital, it's still true today that 90% of the people in the hospital who are in because of COVID are people who are unvaccinated. Now, a small percentage of people who are vaccinated have shown up in our hospital, and some of them are pretty sick. To date, in San Antonio, we have zero deaths in the vaccinated population. So we are seeing 100% protection against dying if you were vaccinated. That sounds pretty good to me, and it gives me some comfort, and I'm glad I was able to get the vaccine. And I desperately want to message anybody in San Antonio who hasn't been vaccinated to please go get one. You can go to Walgreens, you can go to CVS, you can go to HEB, you can go to the Alamo Dome Wednesday through Friday in the afternoon from 4 to 8 p.m. You can come to see us at UT Health. We're vaccinating as well in our outpatient clinical building every single day, uh, morning and night. So it's not hard to find vaccine anywhere in this city, including our mobile vaccine administration units that are going all over the city to have pop-up clinics and we're talking about adding um, odd hours. You know, you've heard that there's been vaccination at the airport. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be really creative and get this out to people as best we can. Plenty of opportunities. I know the advice for now the vaccinated and unvaccinated is to mask right now with such the spread that we have in our community, doctor. So just explain again, even with the Delta variant, how masking is still effective. Right. So. Um, you've heard that the Delta variant has made the virus more contagious, but it didn't make the virus get teenier and tinier. It still will be blocked by a physical barrier. So it still makes all the sense in the world to put your mask on. And in fact, that is everyone's recommendation up and down the line is to wear a mask when you're in any kind of a public place, whether you're vaccinated or if you're unvaccinated. And by the way, no one can tell me I can't wear my mask. <laughs> think that to yourself. And think about that when you go to the supermarket. I was in the supermarket on Sunday afternoon doing my weekly shopping just this past week and about a third of the people in there did not have a mask on. That's just a couple of days ago. That shouldn't happen. Put your masks on when you go to the supermarket, wash your hands and watch your distance and stay away from people. There are so many questions uh, that I wish we had time to get to, but I know a huge concern for people right now based on the volume of emails, comments, questions we are getting is kids. Kids going back to school uh, with what we're seeing more severe cases, more serious cases in children with this Delta variant. What is your advice to parents who are sending kids back into the classroom? Right. So your concerns are well founded and it's not a lie that our hospitals are seeing more and more pediatric patients, even very young ones, getting very sick. And one of the ways that all of us in San Antonio as a community, one of the ways we can protect our children is for us to get vaccinated 
uh, because that does add a measure of protection for the kids. So that's number one. The kids who can't get vaccinated yet are going to benefit when their moms and dads and their uh, home caregivers and their teachers are vaccinated. Next, I strongly recommend that children mask in school. They should mask and they should all be educated at home about smart things that they can do to help minimize their risk, like remembering to wash their hands often um, and like keeping their physical distance away from other people um, when they're engaging in activities. And one of the most important things is about eating. A lot of the outbreaks that we're seeing, even in the vaccinated people here at our own health science center, have happened when people take their masks off and sit down and eat together. You know, they may have gotten a boxed lunch from somewhere because they were being careful and not uh, eating from a communal tray, but then they take off their masks and they eat. Now that will happen in schools as well. And so I think that kids who are in school need to be taught that that time when you're eating is a time of potential for transmission. And it's where if you can be outdoors, that would be safest. And certainly you want to keep physical distance from other people when you have your mask off. This will be a challenge for teachers, parents, administrators in the mm -hmm. next coming weeks, and certainly one already for our health care providers. We always appreciate your time, Dr. Bergren. We will see you uh, next week to tackle more of these big questions. Thanks so it's much. It's always the right time to do the right thing. That's a paraphrase of Martin Luther King, and we should all remember that. Thanks for sharing that as well with us tonight. Thank you, doctor. And we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Quick look at traffic. Things, again, not looking as kind of crazy as they were uh, yesterday. Things looking fine on roads, including I-10 and ProBant. Uh, we do have some of those uh, ramp closures this evening, so watch out for that. But looking overall at the map, things are looking fine. Let's take a look at the travel guide. Uh, travel guide, travel time on I-10. You don't have time for a travel guide to Bernie, but you can get there in 24 to 25 minutes. And inside 1604, 11 to 13 minutes. Some delays on Bandera Road and the Leon Valley area, 18 minutes between 1604 and 410, only 11 minutes the other way. So watch out for that if you're traveling on Bandera Road this evening, guys. Thanks, Samuel. Look outside with live cam. Cool day as far as August is concerned, thanks to some of the rain and lots of clouds out. Yeah, we stayed in the 80s for high temperatures across the vast majority of the KSAT 12 viewing area. Not real August-like around here. Mm -mm. Not hearing too many complaints. A few isolated showers can't be ruled out this evening. Actually, right now, just south of Gonzales, a little bit of lightning and thunder with one. We'll look at the radar, talk about how much rain fell and where, a recap of the drought monitor, and of course, how hot it may get in this weekend and next week coming up. All right, some storms this morning, some yes. good rain once again. Yeah. Wondering if there's more where that came from. Right, I love the temperatures though. Mm -hmm. Right? If just stop here, that'd be good. <laughs> great. That's not gonna happen. The rain got in the way of our little neighborhood uh, CrossFit workout this morning, but that allowed me extra time to uh, assemble a few more thermometers, mm -hmm. work on some more scales, stamp them, cut them, and get some extra thermometers ready. Because after all, we know what day it is. Welcome, Sam. Big day. Yes. Thermometer Thursday. I cannot <laughs> wait. I can hear the confetti in your voice right now. Yes. Oh, confetti in your voice. <laughs> right? I just coined that. Adam Cassie, 2021. You're welcome. Copyright. All right, exactly. Trademark everything. <laughs> a break from the rain on the way. Sunny and seasonable weekend. We're not looking at a big spike in temperatures anytime soon. Even despite full sunshine this weekend, that soil moisture, I think, will help keep our temperatures just a couple of degrees below average even. New drought monitor, of course, that's in. We talked about that last half hour. I want to show you again across the state. I mean, we are just in great shape. Sure, abnormally dry right along the Rio Grande and a few isolated areas, but the Lone Star State as a whole, only 1% is considered in drought. Three months ago, that number was 45%. And look at the heavy rainfall that we had earlier today. And you look just southwest of San Antonio, Zavala County, Dimmick County. We're looking at Carrizo Springs to Crystal City. Anywhere from four to eight inches of rain estimated, even just south of Eagle Pass and in El India there in southern Maverick County. Fairly rural areas, but those ranches are 
and pastures are definitely definitely smiling from all that rainfall. That's good, especially as a drier pattern starts to settle in. Southern Bear County had two to three inches of rain, especially in along the 1604 area. You look outside right now near Campbellton, a few little downpours just popped up, uh, struggling to really hold together just south of Gonzales. A little bit of lightning and thunder associated with that lone or isolated downpour, and we could still see a few of them tonight and then tomorrow particularly into the afternoon, a 30% chance. So widely separated and highly isolated in nature. So not very numerous and into the weekend, not even a chance next week. I think we'll be dry. There's just that little wild card of a few coastal showers popping up. So anybody in Lavaca County, De DeWitt County, Goliad, Victoria, you could have a few of those afternoon showers next week. By and large, we're looking at a dry stretch here this weekend on through next week. Look at the temperature 73 this morning. It's three degrees below average, 88 for the high temperature and about a quarter of an inch of rain in San Antonio. 86 outside right now. Beautiful sunset taking shape. Some mid-level clouds lingering. It's going to be a lovely sunset. So take a peek outside, look off to the west and you'll see that in the coming well, about hour and a half or so. Del Rio near 90, but still only upper 80s, 86 Hondo, 90 to Catula and Laredo, and those are the hot spots. Tomorrow, we'll start the day at 74, make it up to 92, southeasterly breeze at 5 to 10. Then this weekend, just sunny and, well, even a few degrees below average in the mid-90s, and that's going to stay in place all the way through next week. All right, you know, my favorite way of giving away thermometers is the surprise factor. Right? Yes. Oh. Yes. Ah, get a reaction out of we folks. We are aware. All right, let's roll the video here because at the opportunity, it is our intern, Caitlin Simonson's last day at KSAT. So Katie Blake and I colluded to take this secret video. Wait for it. Wait for it. She's working diligently. Thermometer Thursday! <laughs> <laughs> you are the winner of this week's homemade nice thermometer. <laughs> for being such a wonderful intern and all. I hope you can paint your dorm room or your room and take it with you. And then when you get your first job, you can look at it and just- There we go. We got her heart rate up there a bit with that surprise, but- You got my heart rate up. I was 50 feet away in the newsroom. I, I heard Ursula pretty far away too. What was that? I, th I thought y'all would be kind of accustomed to it by now, but I guess not. Okay. I don't know if there's any getting used to that. So Caitlin Simonson of UIW, <laughs> meteorology student, Mm -hmm. Keep on trucking and doing what you're doing and, uh, of course, best wishes and keep in touch. All right, let's take a look at our other winner today. Yeah, we're not just leaving it there. No, no, no. I had extra time this morning. Jamie Calisti of San Antonio. The one, the Jamie Calisti I just emailed and I heard back from already. Woo, quick. KSAT.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. <laughs> Said with confetti in his voice. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. And good morning. It is Thursday, August 5th. At five, the Bear County Sheriff's Office on a murder case looking for this man, 37 year old Fernando Rojas. He also goes by the name of Beans and is considered a person of interest in the shooting death of 28 year old Serena K. Bain. She died yesterday after she was shot in the abdomen in the 10,000 block of South Loop 1604 East. That's near Elmendorf. He's considered armed and dangerous. Francisco Ortiz is being charged with possession and intent to sell. He had 75,000 pills of what looked like oxycodone but contained fentanyl. The street value over a million dollars. They were all, let's call them hot pills, overdose pills. There were enough pills seized that would have killed more people than died in the Vietnam War. <coughs> a little bit of cough, but <coughs> um, I'm trying to hang in there, so. A 35-year-old single mom with two children, Monique Chavez is actually somewhat luckier than many unvaccinated COVID patients. She hopes to go home Sunday after only a week in the hospital. Ten people dying in a crash yesterday when their van flipped and crashed on Highway 281 in Encino. The Texas Department of Public Safety says it was a van carrying migrants. The fan flipped on 281 and crashed into a utility pole about 50 miles north of McAllen. More than 12 other people were injured. 
The Brooks County Sheriff's Office says most of the passengers were undocumented immigrants. They're working with DPS and the Mexican consulate to identify the dead and the injured. <laughs>Uh, too many issues as before we go uh, this evening. This is I-10 at ProBand. Things looking fine there as well as 1604 and Military Drive. But watch out for some construction on 1604 overnight. Also looking here, we mentioned the delays on Bandera Road. They're getting a little worse there in Leon Valley. You're down to four miles per hour this evening, Adam. And Sam, tomorrow we'll start the day in the 70s. Top out near 90 degrees. We'll get into the low to mid 90s along the parts of the Rio Grande, then around San Antonio, downtown 92, Converse 90, along with New Braunfels, Bernie 88, and Castorville, about 90 for the high. A few isolated showers possible tomorrow, so few and far between. And then we get into the weekend, and it's just looking sunny and dry. Good pool weather. Enjoy the sunshine guilt-free because we are drought-free and we have a happy aquifer. Mm-hmm. And temperatures yeah. look good. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the News at 6. Join us for the night beat at 10.